Frank, uh, only to say welcome to the London School of Design and Marketing uh, from London to the world, today in English, but usually in Portuguese and Spanish too, uh, where passion becomes a profession. Marketing after the pandemic, uh, I think it's the right webinar in the right moment. And uh, so please enjoy the LSTM experience. Frank Sullivan will be our, our host, our share of the, of the, of the webinar. He is the marketing and communications director of uh, our institution, and uh, he will present all the people and the, all the subjects of the of the webinar. So, welcome and uh, enjoy our webinar. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Professor. So, I I have the the pleasure of introducing three really really interesting panelists with diverse opinions here. So, we have Stephen Segi, who is a professor from Essex Management School. And the director of the executive MBA, Hugo Silva, the chief marketing officer of Whirlpool, and Renata Baratero, our very own senior tutor and agency owner. Thank you very much for your time in, in advance. Today's topic is the future of marketing. We need to know where we've been to know where we're going, and we need to have a look at the, the fundamental changes, trends, strategies, and impact that the pandemic has had on consumers, employees, our businesses and organizations, but also how we respond to that change. So I would really like to get a quick introduction from, uh, from Renata into our very first, first question, which is about the lockdown. It's about consumer behavior. So around March 2020, year and a half ago, we went into lockdown. That meant movement was heavily restricted after the public health scare, a lot of businesses closed, there was a lot of uncertainty, there was a lot of disruption, especially in consumer facing, uh, consumer facing industries. And there's been this mass movement, this mass migration online. And some of it has been building up over time and the pandemic was the catalyst. Some of it is changes um, that we never, we may never return to the way thing, things were. So Renata, my first question to you is, how have consumers behaved in the past before the pandemic and how are they behaving now? You're in mute, Renata. Okay. Okay. So good afternoon, Frank. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me being here today. Uh, so uh, I will say that the world, as we know, uh, it will certainly not revert back to the to the old normal. Uh, uh, if before the, the pandemic, we we're already living in a global digital uh, age. Now more than ever, products and services are commercialized globally, which reinforces the, the importance of digital migration. Uh, I also think the being in lockdown has made people value human relationships even more. Uh, and before uh, customers, uh, when researching for products or services, uh, they, they hope to find uh, the product or their service they want. Now they really expect to find it. So, so they want to find it and they want to find it fast. Uh, related to, to the supply chain processes, we now watch customers highly concerned, not only with fast deliveries, uh, but also with the safety standards and hygienic factors. Uh, and this was caused by, by the COVID pandemic. Uh, as new behaviors, I, I think uh, we are, uh, co uh, consumers are more aware uh, of uh, affordability, uh, of uh, health, sustainability, uh, living in society and uh, the experience. They want to, to live the moment, uh, to make the most of life, uh, and they are open to, more open to, to new types of products, brands and experiences. I think that that's really insightful. Those five factors. I hope our students were were taking note, and we'll, we'll reference those in in their research. Um, Stephen, let me ask the the company with a cause. Do you think that consumers demand now more more than ever 
that their companies take an ethical standpoint or take a particular view on topics? You're on mute. Okay, yes, I wasn't able to unmute myself. I was trapped there for a second, unable to unmute. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a very interesting thing that we're seeing. You mentioned already um, that people were forced online. We already have people who are very heavily online anyway. Um, but I think a lot more people were forced on online. So it speeded up this process. I think, I mean, one of the things that always strikes me is we've seen... And I'm not sure whether this is a cause of what, 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 what the pandemic did to this and what didn't do this, but we saw an explosion in things like Black Lives Matter um, in the past year as a response initially to so the, the, the murder of George Floyd. Um, but we're also seeing, I think, because everybody is sort of hyper online, this quickly goes across the Atlantic. It goes from, you know, America to the UK to mainland Europe um, very, very quickly, a lot more quickly than it has done perhaps in the past. Um, American politics is very, very partisan. Um, so the debates are very, very sort of bipolar in the, in, in the way they come along. Um, we're seeing all this kind of identity politics and all this kind of culture war um, pushing into, um, it's funny because I, I know I noted down Renata mentioned lived experience and I hear it all the time now as people are talking about, you know, respect my lived experience. And then, at, which is, Interesting because everyone's lived experience, of course, is completely different. But then the demands from companies or the, the consumers then demanding from companies to take a particular stand on um, specific issues. And, you know, how do brands, how do companies, you know, famous before the pandemic, of course, Colin Kaepernick, Nike, um, you know, and, 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 and that campaign that was there. Now, of course, that was very thought out by Nike because they knew that where their growth was. The growth is external to the US, which doesn't really care. Um, and also young people in America are very much pro what Kaepernick was doing. So that was a, it was a, an astute business move anyway. But this then went from, you know, um, Colin Kaepernick to Black Lives Matter to Scottish footballers in the Scottish Premier, Premier League kneeling before football games. So you're seeing this culture war um, kind of global culture war or, or US culture war being sort of imposed. And in France, of course, the French are pushing back against this as well. And the whole notion of um, uh, seeing it as a form of uh, kind of separatism, they call it essentially. Um, but then, you know, as I said, consumers demanding that companies have my the same belief system that I have, which I think is very challenging for companies to know what to do. Thank you, Stephen. Hugo, your your company's products are used by millions of people around the world, and you have relationships with uh, your distributors that, that have changed. Your uh, The source of your sales has changed significantly. Could you tell us how, how things have evolved for Whirlpool over the last 18 months? Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the for the invitation. Well, what has changed in the, in the Whirlpool space? Uh, for those that don't know, just to frame it a little bit more, uh, Whirlpool is the owner of Hotpoint and Indesit brands that are ninety nine percent of our business in the in the UK. Um, Whirlpool, being the the mother brand, is the smallest in in the UK by by historical reasons. Changed a lot. Um, for instance, and picking up a little bit what uh, Renata said, uh, more operationally, we had to take care even more to expand uh, the operation in terms of supply chain. Uh, that means uh, non interesting things for marketing guys, but uh, we had to buy more trucks, we had to hire more uh, delivery guys, uh, instruct them in terms of marketing, uh, produce more t shirts with the logos and and training how to, ins to, to install and so on. So to bring more marketing tools to the supply chain operation. Why? What One of the things that also changed a lot in the last 18 months is if ratings and reviews in terms of products were important, now they are absolutely important. They drive the business. If you have a good rating and good reviews of a product, meaning 
could be in our case uh, home appliances could be from the product uh, itself physically speaking so i like the product it's good or from the installation the guy that came to my door was a nice guy and installed everything without uh, any dirt inside and so on uh, so we understood even more that owning the consumer journey from from beginning to the end is absolutely important uh, to sell uh, and to, to overcome uh, to overcome uh, our competitors and what happened in the last 18 months is that the demand well quarter two last year so april to june uh, the market in the uk as across europe uh, crashed between 30 and 40 percent but after june july um, everybody started to uh, spend instead of spending the money on vacations they spend the money on on things to to to, to home um, including of course home appliances and we had a boom of demand that uh, basically we could not supply 40 percent of uh, the total demand we had and even so we grew more than 10 percent uh with a super constrained uh, supply chain in terms of raw materials uh, containers from china and turkey and so on so a huge mess but even so the market is uh, and the consumers are still uh, looking for for, for products uh, the way they look for products in a digital space that changed a lot uh, with the lockdown of uh, shops closing um and we improved from our brand uh, websites uh, uh, we are now uh, putting together a big data uh, lake that is able to connect all the information we have about our consumers from home deliveries from uh, repairs that we also do our own uh, we and uh, and from ratings and reviews putting everything together so that we know where our shoppers are, where our consumers are, what they like or don't what they like. Uh, invest in the proper marketing tools um, in terms of uh, the consumer journey and the shopper, the shopper journey. Um, and today we are able uh, to know if tomorrow I want to sell, I don't know, freezers. I know where to put my investments and I know the sales conversion that I will have. So, 18 months ago, this, this was not possible. So we were not knowing uh, if the investment was correct or not. Today, I know with 99% secure what I will sell tomorrow if I invest X, for instance, digitally speaking. So Hugo, uh, let me move this on a little bit. I, I think the, the three of you have identified some, some excellent factors here. Renato, you're talking about the, the, the high standards that consumers are holding companies to for sustainability and ethics. Stephen, you're talking about the impact of politics, identity politics and race and uh, the, the, the impact of social causes or causes for social justice have on, on how brands operate with their consumers. And, and, and Hugo, you're, you're, you're talking about this, this pent up demand that has has really driven online sales for you, but it's interesting how the three company, how the three industries have responded differently. For example, for for, for LSTM, I don't think we had a, a COVID specific strategy because we were always immune to the effects of the pandemic because we've been doing online learning for five years. We know how to do it really well, but. In our discussions, Hugo, you've mentioned vertical integration as a as a key strategy for Whirlpool in order to achieve what exactly? Is it control service quality? Is it to make sure that your supply chain is efficient? Why has that been a strategy for for you to to cope with the pandemic? Um, as I mentioned, so knowing that uh, if you own the quality of your um, supply chain excellence, um, in what every single point of contact that you have with your consumer, um, you own the ratings, the reviews, you own the brand trust, you own uh, the brand preference in the future. Um, 
if we deliver selling technical products is not uh, or electronic technical products is not uh, is not like selling uh, toothpaste or um, or potatoes it is not so you need you need to take care of the consumer uh, in the life in the whole life cycle of the product so since since the beginning that you you try to sell something until the end of the life cycle uh, of the product including recycling in the end so you need to now we are saying to our consumers that guys in 10 12 15 years when your 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 product is dead uh, we will take care of it we go to your house we take care of it so that's the sustainability that renato was mentioning that today the message is not only the product if the product is recyclable if the product is 70 percent or or 80 percent recyclable or is coming from a, from a, a known source and so on is the whole period of life of the product and the, and the and its um, usage during the its life that is important to send this message so in the end we felt the need uh, that even with um, uh, we had in the past already as a, a, a vertical integration we increased it to the level that today we don't need nothing outside our company in the uk uh, to have it, to to be in touch with the, with the consumer in terms of product interface so Hugo, I'm going to pass the question to Stephen. Vertical integration has been one particular strategy, but I've also seen a lot of disaggregation, a lot of disintermediation for some of the larger players and companies like Amazon Excel or, um, or fulfillment and logistics providers come in and fulfill that role. Yeah. What do you think is the 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 ability of small businesses to compete with big businesses knowing that you can use a company like amazon excel to achieve as good a supply chain as you you could you could get obviously without heavy vertical integration you're not going to be able to control everything but let's say that uh, our small business selling t-shirts branded t-shirts could be shipped anywhere anywhere in the world if we used amazon excel and we could have it there within 24 hours. How has the pandemic leveled the playing field? That's an interesting question. And I think, you know, we look at why were startups able to compete with, you know, large companies, large conglomerates or, or, or established uh, companies before. And it was always about, you know, 20 years ago, you know, the hard drives and the, the, the cost of storage was so big and now you just do it on the cloud and, and it's allowed, you know, startups to compete from day one with large companies. And again, you're seeing a very similar thing here where, you know, so many services are now available um, um, and it does allow for competition. It also makes it very difficult to understand where your competition is coming from for, for companies and how to scan the environment because, you know, who are your real competition or who's, who's getting the job done that you want to get done? I mean, I think it's, a little bit easier perhaps and you know when you're talking about white goods or you know these kind of things where there's some there's a clear you know who's the competition that's somewhat clearer but i think you know when you're looking at slightly more nebulous issues um then you know what where is your competition set and and who is it where can the next competition come from and the scanning and, and, and your environment is a very very difficult thing to do um and i think yes of course such technological advances will um level the playing field substantially um and allow these startups which have so much money um you know being invested and throwing their way um in america in europe as well um so much money being thrown their way that yes uh, without doubt um you know the competition will heat it up substantially in that regard renata can you give three examples of how the pandemic has affected you um our employee, well, I say us as, as LSTM, both work for the same business. How has it affected, how has it affected us as employees, as students, as, as customers? Three specific examples, please. So I, I will say that uh, uh, being a voice of LSTM today, 
uh, we we then we didn't have a, a a big impact because we were already a digital school uh, which relies on distance learning so for us i think uh, the the major impact uh, was not being able to to do the graduation ceremony with our students in london uh, but i truly believe we, we soon we will be doing that uh, uh, it was covid it was positive for us because uh, we have a need to expand our structure uh, to hire more academic advisors and tutors to provide the best service and support to our students. Uh, if before uh, we had to explain to, to students and to people in the, the admissions process what was the learning, now everyone knows what it is, so the consumer mind has changed. Uh, and uh, considering uh, our students, the, the large ma ma the large majority was already uh, located around the world. So uh, for us as a digital uh, company, uh, it, it was uh, positive. Thank you, Renata. Stephen, three ways that the pandemic has affected your organization. What's the impact being specifically about your students, customers, employees, uh, Go. No, it's interesting. It's interesting just listening to what Renata was saying there as well about, you know, I mean, we're a very different school. We're a traditional kind of elitist French business school. It's very, very different to what you guys are doing. So it's interesting, you know, because with the, some of the challenges, of course, we had, we had a huge investment to put in, first of all, just so we could have kind of like blended classrooms, classrooms that had the technology. So we had a few million dollars or a few million euros worth of investment to actually make our um, both executive education classes and also um, for the grand calls so for the master's level, um, sort of up to scratch. That was one thing. I mean, that's a very practical thing. I think something's quite interesting, though, there's like our applications increased. So you see this, it's kind of interesting. And I think we will see a sort of you know, stratification in, in, in the education markets where we have a very, very powerful brand um, in France and also to some degree internationally as well. I think, you know, FT rankings, we are ranked top 10 FT rankings for executive education, stuff like that. So I think with that brand, um, it does mean actually that we've got more applications for what we're doing. I think, you know, if you look at the executive MBA, um, people are thinking about their career. Do they really want to do this anymore? And how can they retrain and all that sort of thing? So there's a lot of, you know, we're seeing greater demand for our service. Now, at different levels, if you will, of traditional, you know, business schools, education, whatever, I think you're seeing huge problems with, you know, particularly in America for multiple reasons, not just COVID. It's also, you know, Donald Trump visas for international students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing, which I think was perhaps slightly unexpected. Um, I think one thing just on a personal level that, you know, yes, we're able to have meetings. Yes, we're able to kind of, you know, replicate a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, but one thing we don't have is kind of the, the, the chance meetings at the coffee machine, the chance meetings at the water cooler that spark off ideas, the innovation at the water cooler type um, thing that sparks off these ideas and that allows us to kind of, you know, bump into people that we wouldn't otherwise bump into and kind of these unplanned kind of meetings. Um, that take place one other thing since you asked for three things um one thing because you know a lot of what we do is about conferences and and, and thinking about going to conferences we had a conference before this i was actually giving a doctoral consortium and it was online and I really started to think personally as much as anything else about if we're going to have an online conference what should we be replicating because what's happening i think with a lot of these kind of online events is they're just taking what was what was done face to face so we had a presenter on stage talking to 500 people now we have a presenter on zoom talking to 500 people but given that we have a chance to kind of reinvent this and kind of go back to first principles as to why we do this i mean this there's a path dependency that brought us to that stage with conferences well what if we're going to do this virtually what should it actually look like rather than just replicating what we're doing in a virtual environment are there other things that we should be doing that make it more you know in the social event the social component of um these kind of events conferences how do you replicate that social component in an online environment which is very kind of false and breakout rooms don't really do it you know so what are we trying to do i think you know and the initial response to covid was just oh let's push things online as quickly as we possibly can um 
you know, in ours, I, I launched an EMBA in, in, on April the 1st last year. Um, we went from, you know, this was so we knew in February, we have a campus in Singapore, so we knew in February what was coming. But we had six weeks to just put it all online. So we redesigned parts of it, et cetera, put it online. But it really got us thinking about, you know, what should we be doing to do this kind of in a blended, more digital, or what are we just going to take back to the classroom? What will stay? What will change? What will come back um, to what it was before, et cetera? So it just made, we're, I think we're still working through that um, as well. Hugo, three examples of how the pandemic has specifically affected you and your team. Well, I, I wrote, I wrote three, three, and now, and now after listening to Stephen, I changed two. So, <laughs> uh, no, because he, he gave a couple of examples that uh, leaving the business a little bit outside, so numbers and trucks and so on. One of the things that changed a lot is that uh, we have in our office in Peterborough. Uh, a huge um, 2,000 square meters of uh, showroom that until March last year we were using for trade partner events to present new products and so on and so on. With the pandemic, uh, we arrived to the place that we were paying it because it's a rented space and so on, it cost a fortune, and we were using it for nothing. So the first three months were basically closed. And then as we saw that uh, the pandemic uh, period will would, would be one or two years in front of us, we said, okay, let's do uh, a different uh, utilization of it. So we changed the showroom into more um, a studio. Uh, and we started to make personalized presentations of the products uh, to our trade partners, for instance. And it went so well that today, th this studio is used for the whole uh, Europe, for the whole organization to produce content uh, for our products in the, the websites of the, the, the trade partners to sell, basically. So a big portion of the, the qualitative uh, uh, content that we produce in terms of video and photos is taken today in, in, in the UK for the rest of the trade. So it's, it's, uh, and it will, it will stay like that because it's a good, a good, uh, a good uh, and profit uh, utilization of the space. What also changed, and also Stephen mentioned a little bit the same, uh, for us, as uh, uh, I am a leader of 40 people in, in, the, in the UK, for instance, and uh, what changed in terms of leadership is massive. To lead a team, virtually speaking, the whole day during one and a half year, it's crazy. It's, uh, it's a super challenge uh, because that interaction that Stephen was saying, so going to the coffee, uh, speaking to someone, how's the how's the mother, how's the father, how's the kid, and so on. That is that. So it's 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 the the the, the happy hour of five o'clock to have a coffee or a beer in the in the office is no longer. So, and that is a challenge for for everybody that leads people, uh, and for sure for, for for those that give classes also the same. The human interaction. Um, I think that part forget the digital because we will go. Uh, again, uh, after it, because we, we cannot live in a, in, a, in a front of a computer the whole life. It's, it's not possible. That we will buy much more online, that's for sure. That we will look for more information online, even if we buy offline, that's for sure. But the rest, I hope we all go back to a normal uh, beer on the hand, otherwise uh, it's, a, it's a crazy world. Can I, ask, uh, can I ask a question, Hugo? Yeah. Um, just how did you deal with that kind of what did you do with your team because I mean obviously you know you have to replicate in some way this kind of informal yeah. what did you yeah. what did you do it depends the level of the the person in the team um, but you have to connect one one to one every single week be weekly monthly a weekly meeting with a, with a certain team and so on and so on so on every I give you an example every Mondays, I have a weekly meeting with my trade marketing uh, team. I have a weekly meeting with my category team. I have a weekly meeting with my brand and digital team and so on and so on. So in the end, I do work more hours. I'm working 10 to 12 hours a day in front of a computer in the same space, jumping to meetings is meetings without, uh, without moving my, my body. So it's, it's, it's strange and tiring at the same time. 
but even so we we managed to have a, a decent because we measure the engagement every week every year with the, with the survey to our employees and uh, honestly went much better than I, I was expecting also because and, and the third point for me is we changed also i had to change my blueprint in the uk because my the marketing department was prepared for the pre-pandemic and not for the pandemic and then the big, big change is that we, we, we had to create internally uh, an agency that produces content, that uh, manages all the Google uh, investments, uh, everything, uh, that we were much more outsourced, let's say. Um, and uh, we integrated also what we call the activation team that is able to uh, produce content also for our trade partners uh, in a partnership way. So the two logos uh, together. So AO and Whirlpool selling this at the same time. And that we, 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 we changed a lot the, the blueprint uh, for this agency model. And uh, honestly, it's, it's working, but was quite challenging because everybody, every single element in the, in the team changed uh, their tasks. Um, well, hello. and doing that, hello. doing that with, um, with, um, with a, in a virtual system is not is not easy, honestly speaking. That was a big challenge. So there's one really important topic that I I, I want to raise. We're we're coming towards the the end the end of our our webinar time here, but I want to talk about the role of mental health. We don't often mention this um, webinar is talking about the future of marketing. We talk about trends and analytics and, and what's going on, but I think I think we we need to acknowledge that the lack of physical contact um, it, it doesn't just impact on customers and change their behavior. It also affects the employees and the teams that work for our brands. And Stephen, a, a, a good example from the LSDM side, we use. Uh, we've borrowed from 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 agile software development. We do stand-ups for the sales and marketing team. So we've got a team of of, of thirty, you know, uh, uh, across the company. But we've got a team of sixteen or seventeen meeting for fifteen minutes every morning to ensure that there's um, smooth communication. But let me ask, how have you approached the topic of mental health in in your, your, in your university, Stephen, and, sure. and Hugo, Renata, respectively. You go first, please, Stephen. Sure. I mean, no, one, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I think, you know, one of the things that Essex instituted was a kind of, they called it a kind of together campaign. They kind of launched a kind of online, and it was quite, I, I can, I mean, maybe I should roll it back a little bit. I think when you're talking about, you know, Essex is, you know, one of our missions is to be an international or a global business school with French roots. So we were a very traditional, you know, 30 years ago, it was a very traditional French organization, part of the kind of infrastructure of France. For people who don't know the Grand Ecole system very well, we, you know, so the new Danone CEO is a graduate of ours. The previous one was a graduate of HSE. So all these, you know, French corporations are run by, you know, HSE graduates, SA graduates, et cetera. So very, very French organization, which became very international. The reason why I mentioned that is because, you know, when, when this was brought in, this kind of together campaign was brought in, a lot of the activities were done in French. So one of the things we had to talk about was, look, we have um, students who are international students who are perhaps away from their families, and they're the ones that really need the support. And we also have international faculty, not so much me, you know, my family's here, you know, I can speak French, that's not a huge problem, but we have international faculty maybe on their own, and how can we then provide support for them? So, you know, we'd have yoga classes and stuff like that, and, and meetings. We had a departmental meeting every Friday, um, similar to what Hugo was saying, that we'd have, you know, 15 people together every Friday, just for half an hour, just to make sure, I mean, there's one or two faculty in our um, department who are quite old, live on their own in Paris, and, you know, living in an apartment in Paris, unable to leave the building, it can be quite you know, lonely anyway. So I think there was a lot of attempts to have regular contact. There were certain activities that were put out vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, yoga was a classic one and also just discussion groups and, and various things that were done. But I, I don't think necessarily we were prepared for that. Um, it was something that had to be produced 
you know, the HR group did a huge amount of work into putting this package together for people to, because you're right, I mean, I felt it myself, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, almost every day I would feel some kind of like the blood rate, the blood pressure rising in my body to my head. And for about a month, I was living with that. And then I was like, I can't do this. And we couldn't, so I go out there and run. I mean, in France, the number of people took up running because it was one of the few activities that was allowed any time of the day. So everyone's out running or walking their dog or any of these things. So I think, you know, encouraging that as well, encouraging sport um, and dealing with people who have mental health problems anyway. And 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 it, these would then be exacerbated by, by the pandemic. I think also in France, you've seen, this is slightly related in France, you've seen, um, uh, for high school students and for uh, middle school students, they're being offered free kind of um, psychological counselling because it's also been very difficult for them. Um, you know, it's just this relentless, especially at the beginning when there was no obvious light or no obvious way out of what was happening kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, I think we did our best to do it, but, you know, we have coaches that work with our organisations, so we have coaches to help us as well. So we've, but it was a little bit ad hoc. And I think it's one of the, it showed one of the kind of weaknesses in the organisation is that, you know, we weren't really prepared, it's a little bit fragile and um, for how we dealt with the mental health challenges that were, you know, and were occurring. Oh, and I think it's a reality that, that, that has to be acknowledged. And Hugo, uh, 60 seconds, please. Have, have you invested in mental health responses internally within? Yeah, we create a lot of um, uh, actions, plans, uh, during, during the period, it, it continues, honestly, because we are still in, in remote work, 100% almost, um, for those that work in the office, of course. And uh, I don't know, I saw things uh, that I couldn't imagine in the past, so virtual bingos, uh, uh, webinars like this one about football or about uh, kitchen, or food, or whatever. So. We have done crazy things just to to make uh, make people feel that we are connected, honestly, and we do speak. That's the the, the big problem is that if you start to spend the whole time in meetings uh, speaking about work, you are 100% a working a workaholic. Uh, so virtually speaking, uh, to you have to challenge people to participate in things that maybe in the past they were not participating. So bingo, for instance. <laughs> Uh, I couldn't imagine myself doing it, but because my team was there, I was doing it just to be there and to to have some fun and to have some laugh. Even if I'm a, I'm alone at home, so in that sense, yeah, we have done a lot of things. And again, looking at after the pandemic period, I think those those things will stick, offline or online. Uh, the mental health uh, uh, is an issue, and uh, we are uh, we are doing a lot of things for that, and we the whole world will continue for sure. Well, congratulations to, to, to you and Stephen. I, I think that sounds very positive. Renata, we've been doing some things like um, creating our, our community group, organizing yeah, social sure. Within my team, we've been doing a lot of mentoring and coaching uh, through th throughout the year. How do you think that we could support our students better as a response to uh, I think uh, we all agree that being in lockdown has made people uh, value uh, human relationships even more. Uh, as you said, Frank, uh, we have noticed a, a greater need for our students to be connected uh, to each other. So we have invested in the creation of a community where they can interact and exchange experiences. Also, we invest uh, on master classes, podcasts. Uh, we also promote uh, uh, once a month a voluntary uh, voluntary meeting for students, where they can share academic work in progress in order to to share experience and learning and get feedbacks from peers. That's really important. Also, LSTM uh, having marketing tutors. Uh, our job is to support uh, and guide students uh, along their academic. Uh, journey. Uh, I see myself, I, I had uh, synchronous sessions with students where the husband was there, the son was there, uh, all of us together who were trying to installate something on the online campus. So I think that that's a, a part of our, our job in LSTM, support and guide and uh, students through the, the academic path. I think right at the very center of this this webinar the future of marketing 
is the topic of, of uh, being connected and disconnected or the distance between people. So even, even though we're now, I think we're about 50 people on this webinar in 60 different, in, 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 in different countries, in, in 35 different countries now I can see, there's a big physical distance, but I can also feel that people are getting closer. And we've got a lot of students from our community and, and, and some, some people outside as, and, as well. But let me, let me first of all, thank you for, 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 for all of your answers. And I think that's, that's a really good point to mention, not just changing cultural trends or external factors, but there are deep internal structural factors as well that shape our behavior as customers, not just suppliers. And it's the, the intimacy we feel with the brand. It's the connection we feel with the people. A good example, certainly in some of the training that, that I've done is looking at um, companies that are failing online or failing to transform digitally. It's because they're reading all the textbooks, they're doing all the right things, and they're obsessed with the sales journey, as they should be. But the pandemic has meant that you have to throw that playbook out, forget about the sales journey, think about the buyer's journey. And another factor that's happening here is the responses versus reactions. I think a lot of schools, as I, as I summarize what we've been talking about now for the webinar, some schools, their response or reaction has been very different. The reaction has been Zoom, PowerPoint, let's get everything online as quickly as possible versus a response, which is let's think about the best way to design uh, an experience, not just replicate, replicate in the real world online. Like Stephen mentioned, the, <laughs> the, the, the world's most awful conference experience is where you've replicated what's going on at a trade expo on your laptop. I couldn't imagine anything worse. And I guess one of the issues that, 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 that Hugo mentioned as well, in investing in a data lake and building that, that intelligence is that we've gone, from, uh, we've gone from a situation five or 10 years ago where we didn't know enough about our customers. Now we know too much about our customers. Yeah. So with the increasing digitalization of sales and consumer transactions, now he who holds the data holds the future of distribution, holds the future of commercial success because they can predict with a high degree of confidence where that demand is going to be and how to time the sale and how to do all of those things. It's almost like taking the fun out of sales yep. because the data is driving the decisions. So Renata, Hugo, and Stephen, and Professor Pedro, we've talked about the impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic on, on our schools, our businesses. We've talked about the impact on the individual, customers, stakeholders, students, employees, and the important role that um, how we feel is as important as what we need and what we want. We've talked about the, the, the very big picture, the macroeconomic stuff like trends of moving toward you know, convenience and buying things for cultural reasons all the way down to the, the, the microcosm of how we know each other one-on-one, -on -one, how we use, how we engage, how we connect and how we invest in mental health. We've talked about the changing role from the sales journey to the buyer journey and whoever is collecting the data will really control the future success of their, their organization. And we've also talked about collaboration models. Hugo mentioned the example of building an internal agency it's kind of what we've done as well as our team has grown. We've brought a lot of functions in-house. Uh, Stephen, you, you've, you've mentioned how students are collaborating in a blended learning environment. I mean, our, 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 our schools are at vastly opposite end, ends of the spectrum, one being a traditional business school, one being a, a digital school in, in marketing, but we've both, we both serve the same constituents, it's people who want to learn. So blended learning, is there a place for that after the pandemic? One thing I do know is that business is not going to be the same because the pandemic, I do apologize for the beagle barking in the back garden. <laughs> we, two things that I, I, I know, we're not going back to the way things were because consumer trends have changed. 
and that we do need to be conscious of how we're treating people and how we're adapting moving forward. I'm going to go on, go on mute now until that beagle shuts up. Stephen, 60 seconds to wrap up, please. The future of marketing, what is the number one trend that you see and your key advice to students? Okay, so the, one, the number one trend I see, I think, is that yes, we are seeing more and more digital happening. And I, and I want to push back a little bit on what Renata and Hugo were saying, not necessarily that it will not become digital, then we will continue to be get more and more digital. But I wonder, the, the law of unintended consequences is always lurking there. There's things that we don't know um, that are going to happen that are going to happen. And I think sometimes when everybody's thinking exactly the same thing, um, it's a little bit good idea to step back for people and say, hold on, it, it, what's the reasons why this is happening? What's the drivers of this? And it, is it possible that the future could be different to how everybody is saying it's going to be? And then decides on careers and everything else. Um, so that's a little, be a little, be a little bit contrarian, um, push back a little bit on what is the perceived wisdom of the crowd at that particular time. Thank you, Stephen. Renata, top trend that you see and how marketeers should be investing for the for, for the future? What's coming down the pipe? I will say, Frank, that uh, personalization rules. So before we are competing with competitors, now we are competing with customers' last best experiences. So uh, even we are facing several data protection laws around the world, as you say it, uh, with the, the high levels of uh, personal data that marketers can access today, they can personalize the entire customer journey. journey. So I'll say that personalization. Thank you. Hugo, same question to you, sir. Uh, thinking a little bit outside the box. Um, I think the big challenge for us marketeers is um, the digital space is so big today in the sense that, uh, I don't know, the typical consumer, us, we spend, I don't know, six, 10 hours a day online, right? Um, even if you don't work in, in remote work, you spend two, three hours a day online. So the big challenge for us is uh, how the hell do you control every single touch point with a consumer without making a mistake? I'll give you an example. I have 450 people in our call center. If I have someone in one day that is somehow upset with life, and he answers improperly to a consumer, I have an issue because he goes to the consumer goes to Facebook and then goes to Instagram and then says bad things about the brand and so on and so on. So it gives a bad review and so on. That's the big challenge. How do you control? Uh, that, is, that is not in the books. <laughs> How do you control operationally so many people inside an operation that we said is vertical? Yes, it is 2.6 thousand people. Uh, that they do their job properly every single day with every single consumer. That is a big challenge. That's, that's extremely insightful. I think overall, we know that the pandemic has accelerated certain trends. And thank you. I have our final guest panelist, the Beagle in the garden. At that point, <laughs> I would like to hand back to Professor Pedro to offer offer closing remarks. And I can't thank you guys enough for volunteering. We've got, gone a little bit over time, but I didn't want to I didn't want to stop the magic. Thank you so much. Thank Professor. you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Only, only to only to close the the, the webinar. I think it was a, a very good webinar with a, a lot of insights for the future, analyzing the past, the present, and the, and the future. Not only the, the future of the marketing, but the, the future of the, the world where we are living this, uh, this moment. And uh, I would like to say good night, good afternoon, and good morning for all the people. It's impossible to, to, to speak only for one country because we, we are talking for people with the uh, a lot of nationalities, a lot of cultures. So thank you very much for, for your presence in, in our webinar. And I'll pass to, to Frank to the last close.